Our speaker obtained his BS in Electrical Engineering from Manhattan College before moving on to the University of Notre Dame for his Master's and PhD in Mechanical Engineering. After working as a senior project engineer at Technologies Inc., he moved to, J to JPL, where he worked on planetary, dexterous manipulation for rovers and landers, developed algorithms for vision-based manipulation, sample acquisition, and instrument placement for rover platforms, and led several research tasks, including rover-based visual tracking, the development of the Rocky 8 and Axle Rovers. He's also worked on the entry, descent, and landing for the MSL mission. Currently, he's the group supervisor for the robotic systems for the robotic software systems group and the principal investigator of the multi-institutional robotic software architecture clarity. For his numerous achievements, he received many awards, including several NOVA awards and exceptional achievement awards. Today he has kindly agreed to take time from his busy, from his busy schedule to give us a glimpse into some of the coolest and latest technologies being developed at JPL. Without further ado, let's put our hands together and welcome our speaker, Dr. Kusenis. Well, thank you for the introduction, and I want to thank everybody for coming. It is Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock, and uh, I appreciate everybody uh, joining us tonight. Um, what I'm going to be, uh, and I want to also thank the uh, Rover Club for the invitation, and I want to wish them the best of luck in their competition. Um, even though my current job is supervising the software group, I'm going to be not specifically talking about software, but talking about some of the things that we were able to do in the development of the algorithms enabled by the software we've been putting together. I will also cover some of the hardware developments. So the, the work that I'm gonna be talking about, I I'm gonna start fairly broadly and then start uh, narrowing in on a few examples of uh, ro uh, robotic exploration and touch upon some of the ideas and work we've been doing towards future um, technologies. Uh, the, t the talk will focus on two elements, mobility and autonomy. In the area of mobility, the first question we ask, well, why have planetary mobility? The primary reason for planetary mobility, is um, we want to be able to take a suite of science instruments and do, be able to do precise placement of these instruments on disparate targets. The other uh, element is uh, doing uh, planetary mobility enables us to have greater flexibility um, in terms of the investigations we can do um, at, at the different sites. Also, whenever we have discoveries, opportunistic discoveries, you're able to react and be able to investigate that terrain, the soil, the rocks, the canyons, the thing that you discover a lot more effectively. And also you can do site characterizations. So where would you hit certain limitations? One of the things when we start looking at, for example, site characterization, when you start having mobility assets, um, you're gonna be always limited by the amount of coverage you're gonna have. Unlike what you would do with an orbiter, we can get great coverage of large areas and much more easily. You also have the terrain challenges you have to overcome if you're trying to do mobility or if you're trying to do an aerial platform there's also challenges associated with that. And also they tend to be more complex and more expensive. So why autonomy? There are very severe challenges related to communication delays, as you, many of you know, and limited communication windows. Just to give you an example, on the MER rovers, we had a round trip delay of about eight to 42 minutes. And because of the logistics and the scheduling for the deep, deep space network, the uplinks were limited to once a day. So if you're trying to teleoperate any rover, you can't do it if you're talking about doing it on Mars. On the moon, you do have the delay. You may have more opportunities, but it would still be fairly challenging. And then also, you have a greater operational capability if you start applying autonomy. So the challenges with autonomy is you have to deal with and reason about large uncertainties. Also, your computational resources are very limited, and these are primarily driven by the fact that we have to build red-hardened avionics, and they always tend to lag behind uh, what you have available today in standard computing. Uh, power is very limited, and the limitations of power also limits the amount of dexterity and agility that we can put in our robotic platform. 
you go back to some of the very early planetary rovers, uh, the very first successful lunar rover was the Luna Cod 1. As you recall, in 1970, landed on the moon, had a suite of instruments, a set of TV cameras, and they were able to remote control this platform. This lasted uh, a, a, a year, or maybe probably over a year, or maybe around a year. Prior to that, there was an attempt called the Luna Cod 1A that actually failed on launch in 1969. And of course, uh, this was done by the Soviets. And, and the US had the uh, lunar rover in 1971. It supported three Apollo missions, 15, 16, and 17, uh, which was a manned vehicle. And there's been also another one, the Lunacod 2, very similar to Lun Lunacod 1, just larger in size in 1973. All destined for the moon. Um, for Mars, the, some of the, er the earliest rovers were the, uh, also by the Soviets in the 1970s. There was a 4.5-kilogram uh, Mars rover, and that was designed and slated to go on the Mars 2 and Mars 3 landers. Uh, this was a ve the vehicle that you see here on your right, and it had uh, these skis that were, it were by the, articula the articulation and the motion of these skis, was able to actually traverse and it has these bumpers which allow you to do obstacle detection and avoidance. And this was tethered through an umbilical to the lander. If it, so it could only do a very limited uh, maneuvers around the lander. Unfortunately, this, neither rover ever succeeded because the, both landers failed. And then came the successful Sojourner in 1997 that opened up the door for what, you know, the future rovers that came to follow. Um, now, the Sojourner rover, if you recall, it, uh, it was limited in the amount of mobility it did. It did stay alive for 81 days. And it, it was designed, I believe, for six or seven days, and it far, far exceeded its design um, duration. And it did cover a certain distance um, around the lander. And then came the successful Mars exploration rovers, most of you know in 2004, they landed in January and February, one month apart, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. I'm not going to tell you more about them because you probably are quite familiar. But I always like to share this family photo, which JPL recently took, to give you a sense of the scale and how things evolved. Uh, if you look at the Sojourner rover, about 65 centimeters in length, about 11.5 kilograms, uh, and then that led to the development of the Mer rovers, much larger, about 174 kilograms, and now on its way very close to landing is the Mars Science Laboratory at three meters and 900 kilograms. Now the key thing to com comparing these two is that if you look at the amount of instrumentation, MER had a capacity for six kilograms of science instruments, while the MSL rover had a capacity of 65 kilograms. So the amount of instrumentation and the way we handle the samples and do the analysis is much more sophisticated on MSL. Now, when we talk about mobility, rovers is only one element. So I'm going to start covering the different types of programs that explore different mobilities for different planetary bodies. Uh, JP had a number of programs in area platforms. And these are when you go to planetary bodies with dense environments, such as Venus and Titan. A, a good way to get very good coverage and great mobility is to have an aerial vehicle. So the Aerobot has been studied for a number of years at JPL, worked by Jeff Hall and his team, and also the Venus balloons have been studied extensively by uh, Jeff Hall and Victor and a couple of collaborators at different centers, I believe including Caltech. Um, then we do have, um, now there has been also some Oops, I just, there has been also some concept about how do you do sampling from aerial platforms, and I know a couple of Caltech students have been involved in looking at sampling um, from these platforms. If you go to the other form of mobility, which is the wheel mobility, and this is probably the category where we have the largest number of platforms and inventions. Um, if you go back to the 1964 and you see this uh, six-wheeled rover uh, traversing a fairly rocky terrain, uh, trying to um, negotiate that. Uh, and that was done as a collaboration between General Motors and JPL. And then in 1986, there was a big blue rover that we see here on the right. It's again a six wheel, very similar. It has this flexing body. But the difference here is this actually was just actuation. And here there was computing and cameras 
and some level of onboard autonomy to do actual uh, navigation and obstacle avoidance. And a future generation of this was the Rabi rover, which is, was developed in the 1990s by a number of people at JPL. What's interesting, when this was developed, somebody said, well, that's great, but we'll never be able to fly this thing. This is way too huge. There's no way we can fly this. You look back, and then they become, so there was another group that was developing a lot smaller rovers, which was the Rocky series. And here, this was a picture of Rocky IV in 1992 that actually led to the development of the Sojourner. But things have come full circle, where now, the, if you look at Sojourner and MSL, it is the equivalent of the Rocky IV and the Ravi in some form. Now, if you look very closely at mobility and wheel mobility in particular, even smallest variations can mean different type of maneuvering capabilities. So one of the things that we looked at at one point is actually how do we control uh, different types of mobility, uh, wheel mobility platforms as well as Legend. Um, you can classify things in different ways, but one way to look at it is to say, if you have a platform that you don't have any steering, you just get steered, you can actually do some kind of a tank steering where you can drive the one side faster than the other and you can do turns in place and follow arcs. You can do a little bit better without as much slippage with a partially steerable vehicle. A number of vehicles have been developed like the Rocky 7 rover that actually used this paradigm. This is the uh, mobility um, configuration of the Mur, MSL, and Sojourner where we have only front and rear wheel steering and the middle wheel wheels do not steer. These, ha these are very similar in functionality uh, but they're different from an all-steer vehicle, such as the one we've built in terms of research prototypes, that's such as the Rocky 8 Rover. And the main difference is these are Ackerman-steered vehicles, while this one actually can uh, travel in arcs and, and different types of curvatures, keeping its gaze on a particular point in space, as you can orient all the wheels. So this is on the wheel configuration, but if you also look at the wheel suspension, most of the platforms that we have developed are, pass, you know, they comply with the terrain, they're passive suspensions. You lay them on the ground and they, fo they follow the shape of the terrain. But also a number of vehicles have used active suspension where you can actually lift up a leg so you have additional actuation. An example of this is the nano rover that we've developed to explore uh, low gravity bodies. And then of course there's the legged vehicles and the hybrids. So if you think of the more recent one, some of you may be familiar with the athlete, it's a 44 degree of freedom, highly articulated platform that is a hybrid of a wheel-legged system. And the main advantage of this is you'll be able to use very small sized wheels and keep the mass low. And if you're not able to roll over your terrain, you can just walk out of it. And in this video you will see as it's, and you can also use your legs as uh, manipulators to pick up different things. Uh, and to be able to manipulate the surface. So here, that's picking up this box. Now also athlete, to point out a few things, athlete is equipped with a bunch of sensors, there's stereo cameras on each one of the six faces of the hexapod. Um, and you can also do drilling operations. And this was actually designed when there were the plans to go to back to the moon and build the lunar colony. This was supposed to be car to carry the lunar habitats. Um, nowadays, it's also they're looking at being able to land, do a human landing on asteroids. Now, one of the algorithms going on here is some kind of a force, uh, a, you know, force compensation algorithm that tries to keep the platform leveled, and using the the, the force measurements on the uh, on the torque measurements on the joints to adjust the pose of the body. And here is a case where there's an obstacle you don't want to roll over; you just lift your leg and move it. Another class of vehicles are the hybrid hoppers. Uh, and and this, is, this is an example of uh, the, the nano rover, again, developed by Brian Wilcox at JPL, who also developed the athlete rover. And this was developed back in 1997. Same idea of active suspension with wheels. And this was supposed to roll and hop on small bodies. A more recent work that we're doing right now with uh, MIT and Stanford is the concept of this hedgehog which is an internally actuated system that can not only roll on the surface, but you can also hop. When you start going to microgravity environments, this is, there's a, instead of trying to face the microgravity as a disadvantage, you leverage it and try to um, simplify the system to, be, to achieve mobility. Okay. 
So this is the uh, segment on mobility, and I'll get back to that later in the talk. Let me change course and talk about autonomy. The Mars exploration brought both of them very successful. Both of them were designed to last 90 days on the surface of Mars, and they've lasted many, many more years beyond that. The Spirit rover, which has completed its uh, operations on Mars, uh, we're no longer able to communicate with it, has covered a total of 7.7 .7 kilometers. And the Opportunity rover, which is still operational today, has, as of today, has traversed 34.4 kilometers on the surface. And this is an example of the spirit trajectory as it's traversed throughout these soles. And here you can see a zoomed out trajectory. Initially, it started in fairly benign terrain. And as we, you know, we continued to explore, we took more aggressive actions and be able to explore more you know, interesting terrain. Now, if you take a closer look at some of these traverses, this is another traverse from the Opportunity uh, rover. And if you look at this traverse, is what portions of this traverse were done what, using what we call a blind drive and what were done autonomously. So blind drive is you, take, you acquire your images uh, from the panoramic cameras, you download them to Earth, and then the people, the planners, the rover planners look at the, uh, look at the images and then decide. They, can, they look at the images, they can generate 3D maps, and then they can decide what the path of the rover should do. Once that path is designed, there is no feedback mechanism and the rover is driven along that path to avoid the obstacles. When you have fairly scattered obstacles, this works well, and as long as you can see the terrain and you can have 3D data, this would work well. But what happened is then there's, you can't see beyond the horizon, beyond the uh, perception of your cameras, then you have to rely on autonav. So a lot of times when we operate the Opportunity rover, we do a blind drive for tens and tens of meters, let's say 80, 90 meters, and when we can't see any further, we don't have any 3D data, then we turn on the autonav and let it go as far as the energy will allow. And that's been the mode at which this was operated. Now the challenge with autonav, autonavigation, uh, it, it, is, it does take longer to process, and then there's limited onboard battery, so it, it doesn't go as fast as the blind drive. The autonav uses onboard perception and terrain analysis to achieve its navigation. And here you can see the green areas are the autonav portions and the red are the blind. And I'll, I'll get back, okay. So let me delve a little bit further into what's going on on board these rovers and how do they reason about their terrains. If you look at the software system, which is the core of the things that we do in the group, we are responsible for autonomous onboard control software in, you know, in my group. And there's other groups as well contributing to that. Uh, there is the portion that's the operator interface. This is the control we do from Earth. And then you can either run it on a rover or you can run it against the high fidelity simulation. And we often use simulations to develop and mature a lot of the algorithms for autonomy. And then one of the things we want to do is be able to seamlessly interchange between simulation and physical rovers. Now, if you take a closer look at the components of what's going on in the onboard autonomy, there's a, a large suite of software but the things responsible for traverses I would like to cover here. First element is perception. A lot of these rovers are equipped with a number of stereo camera pairs. If you look at the MIR rovers and the MSL, they both have front and back hazard cameras. They also have mast mounted cameras and they usually have two pair of cameras on the mast. One of them is a narrow field of view cameras called the panoramic cameras and the second one is a wider field of view, usually 45 degrees, which are the navigation cameras. The panoramic cameras, also known as the science cameras, tend to be colored or have color filter wheels, and the um, navigation cameras tend to be black and white. From any stereo pair, you can generate a disparity, a disparity map, which is you take your two images, you align them, and you try to find, you, you match every pixel on one side with the other, you go through a, f a number of filtering processes, a number of checks, and after you do that, you're able to build a map that tells you how each pixel matches from the left and the right image. This is an image of a rock, and you can see here it's able to identify that rock. That gets turned into a range map using triangulation. So if you know the disparity of the pixels, then using triangulation, you can come up with uh, the, the range map. And then from the range map, using the um, you know, using the uh, homogeneous transformations, you can come up with what we call a point cloud. 
And as you can see here, this is the cameras are viewing this way. You would see the face of the rock and the shadow here, as you cannot see, you don't have any points. And any, these points, after a certain distance, depending on the baseline, the uncertainty in the information gets very large. But it's fairly good within the first 10 meters, typically. Now you take this point cloud here that we have, and what you do is you overlay a grid on it, and in each grid, you have a whole bunch of points, and you try to do statistics. So the kind of things you would look at are what is, what is the height of these points in the particular cell, and also you look at what is the slope of the plane fit that will fit these cells. And the third thing you look at is what is the roughness, what is the standard deviation of how, how well these fit. You take all these into account, you combine that with the, mobili the mobility platform that you have to come up with what we call a goodness measure. How traversable is that cell? Now that traversability of the cell is a function not only of the image information, it's also a function of the mobility platform. Different platforms have different mobility capabilities. Now if you notice in this picture, so the, the red areas are the hazards, the yellow areas are areas where there are transitions between you know, safe areas to traverse and hazardous area. But also you see some of the bright green and the darker green. And the difference between the two is as you go further, because you don't have perfect, uh, you accumulate error in your localization, then you're not able to rely on older data. On the other hand, that data is valuable, so you don't want to completely ignore it. So it's a way of combining the age data with the newer data and coming up with a map that you're able to define paths, traverse, and get to targets. So here's an example. So this is a little bit beyond, oops. This is a little bit beyond of, you know, this is part of the research program where we've taken advanced capabilities, not only the arc driving and the stop and, uh, you know, uh, drive and stop uh, capability, but we actually did continuous driving, continuous sensing, planning and replanning. Some of these advanced algorithms were developed as part of a competed program that NASA funded. Some of this work here that you see was developed by Carnegie Mellon as well as number of components by JPL. And you can see the rover, what the rover tried to do is it tried to get, let me play this one more time. It did go rather fast. So it's trying to get to a point somewhere here where that you know, arrow, you know, line is pointing. And it has a certain you know, perception area in front of the rover. Tries to, it plans its path, tries to get there, sees the obstacles, and tries to plan around them. So there's a, an initial, there's a replanning phase that's happening here. Tries to get through here, it turns out this is the cul-de-sac, can't get through, tries to make its way, tries to find another path. And it's using a combination of perception from the hazard cameras, these are the cameras on, on the deck here, as well as the masked cameras of this rover. So um, it's combining the two. And it gets to the goal. Okay. Another element in terms of autonomous capability is a d tracking a designated target. So what you want to do, a scientist would like to pick certain targets of interest, and they could be as far as 10 to 15 meters away from the rover. They get very high resolution, narrow field of view imagery. And they should be able to say, go get me a measurement here, then get me a measurement there, 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 and then come back the next day and tell me which one is more interesting, or even pick up the most interesting one and go to it. So a key element is saying, pick a target from a distance and be able to drive and still keep track of that target. Now the challenge of this problem is that, as you can see in this, in this uh, you know, animation here, or this video of the results, that the target shape changes significantly as you get closer. You start by looking at the face, and by the time you get closer, you're really almost looking down at the rock. And then you have all kind of occlusions and um, challenges because of the changes in the appearance of the target. Now it's important to be able to track this target over this distance to within a couple of centimeters uh, to be able to place that instrument on. So this was developed as part of the technology program. It was validated through a six months process and it was taken and flown on the MER rover as part of an extended mission. And here, this, these are the results of running this, one of the results of running this algorithm on, uh, on one of the targets as a target here. And then the rover was able to, I'm not sure why this is not, oh, there we go. Okay, it just doesn't loop. So here, it just showed you the sequence of images that track that target. Now if you, so once you get to the target, you can do a number of manipulation operations. You can um, take spectroscopic imagery, you can acquire a core, uh, you can acquire a soil sample, and so forth. So this is some of the work 
that Paul Backus and his team have been doing for the March 2018 in terms of being able to collect some cores. It's work that also Dmitry Zarsitsky, who has been who's in here, has worked on. And so the coring process takes, you know, um, it acquires the core, and then there is a core caching system that would cache a number of samples uh, for the sample return mission. So once, and then another element of the manipulation operation, if you're trying to do an autonomous manipulation operation, then you want to make sure that there's no collision between the arm and the rover body and the arm and the terrain. And especially when you're actually going up and trying to take a sample, there's usually some rock or something that you're looking at, which itself is an obstacle, but you're trying to get to it. So there's algorithms that actually look at um, how would you uh, avoid the collision. You start putting all these things together, and this is from the research program in 2009, where a team of people has actually de developed and tested this end-to-end -end algorithm. And the only, this is fully autonomous, the only human involvement is the selection of the target. Scientist comes in, picks a point on the rock about 10 meters away, the red marks the spot, and then the rover has to go there, avoid obstacles, track that point, and be able to place the instrument with that level of precision. So here you can see the rover driving around, and if you really notice, the mast is moving to keep track of the target, while the rover is trying to avoid these, these rocks here in front and on the side. So it's trying to weave in between these obstacles, and as it's going over the rocks, um, and it tries to make its way to the target. Now once it gets close to the target, the first thing it's going to do is find the best way to position itself so that the target is in the sweet spot of the arm, so the arm goes in and gets placed on that target to acquire the measurement. So here it's going to orient itself as it faces the target, and then deploys the arm and makes, acquires the measurement. If we're doing this from farther than 10 meters, say if we're doing this from 15 meters away, sometimes we do have to track the, Im the features in a narrow field of view camera, and as we get closer, halfway in between, we transition from the uh, panoramic cameras to the navigation cameras, then we hand it off to the hazard cameras, because they all have different field of views. It acquires the images and then stores back the arm. Now, if you look what the rover was thinking as it was doing this operation, here is the target, and now you see this um, tracking algorithm that I talked about earlier. This is based on a normalized cross correlation, correlation with some tuning and some fault, fault handling capability. Um, and so basically, you can see here, the green spot is where it predicts the target to be, and the red spot where it, when it matches the target. And you can see the changes in the field of view. And this is not a very distinct feature on the target. And we tried to, to test a number of points on this rock. And this is the path that the rover chose. Uh, this is a binarized image of the earlier image I showed you that shows the, pa the path of the rover to the target. Okay. Another capability on these rovers that we have is we call visual odometry. And the idea behind visual odometry is that you pick a whole bunch of features in one of the images and you try to match, you take a step and you try to match these features in the next image. And you keep doing that, you can get a relative pose between one frame and the other. That's very useful when you're actually in uh, high slip terrain, con terrain uh, you're trying to assess how much you moved and your wheel odometry is not very effective. Uh, sometimes what you use, you can use the tracks of the vehicle to create those features on the terrain and then use, uh, use your rear viewing cameras to be able to do visual odometry to assess how much slip you had. No. So where do we go from here? So in fact, the Mars uh, Opportunity rover drove very close and got to this very large crater called uh, Victoria Crater. And this is Cape Verde and Victoria Crater. But when the scientists look at this, there was a lot of interesting uh, things on this, uh, on this terrain that you cannot access. This rover cannot get any closer. Of course, this is an artist's rendition of where the rover was ba based on this actual Mars image. So this is actually a terrain that we, would we call extreme terrain that we would like in the future to explore. Now, why extreme terrain and what are extreme terrains? So extreme terrains are terrains with extreme topographies. You have craters, fissures, canyons, and gullies that are both of scientific interest and also interest for human exploration. Uh, you want to be able to conduct in situ measurements and co collect samples from such terrains. So this is the same Victoria Crater. This is Cape St. Vincent, one other view. 
And if you look at this, you can see the layering uh, that is actually very uh, interesting to access and be able to take measurements. So you can get the uh, history and the stratigraphy of, the, of that region. Now, these are near vertical slopes, so today we cannot access them. Now, if you look at some of the recent discoveries, also in 2000, in 1999, there was this image acquired of the interior of a crater um, in Centuri Montes. And then in 2005, we saw this new feature, this new deposit, that people were wondering what this could be. And this has been observed several times since. And then you also, there's been some discoveries of layered terrains that are also of scientific interest. And if you look at the topography of this, these are fairly steep vertical drops or near vertical drops, slopes ranging from 60 to 70 degrees. And of course, the most recent one was a discovery of these deposits that people think are brine deposits, uh, which are one of the key areas of interest to go after in terms of sampling and finding past habitability. Now, these floors are about half a meter to five meters in width, so they're fairly narrow, and they're on slopes about 25 to 40 degrees. And of course, there's been a lot of interest uh, in going to lunar coal traps, where water ice is uh, thought to be in some, uh, there's some level of water ice there, and the idea is to go in and try to understand the abundance of water ice in the lunar south pole, as well as to be able to explore these coal traps that have never seen a photo on a flight. Now, one of the things to point out, one of the coldest areas in the solar system was measured at 25 Kelvin and was in the lunar southern pole. Uh, another uh, area that's also generated a huge amount of interest are these uh, initial dark spots that were observed in the Themis instrument on the Odyssey mission on Mars. Uh, people um, analyzed them further and they found that these are caves or you know, uh, co collapsed lava tubes. Uh, pit chains and so forth. So you can see here a nice image of one of those on the moon and these are examples from Earth analogs. These are very difficult uh, to explore with today's technology. But people have been thinking about these, even prior to these discoveries, people have been thinking about exploring such extreme terrains. You go back to 1994, the Dante II that Carnegie Mellon put together is a legged vehicle with a tether that went into a volcano Mount Spur. And then people at JPL back in 98 have thought about lowering a, a smaller rover from a larger rover with the tether. And there's been other people who've considered other legged systems and wheel systems as well. This platform here on the right uses three rovers, two on top that control the baseline, two tethers to control a rover going over a cliff. And there's been attempts to do that without a tether by changing the mobility mechanism, this is very similar to the nano rover mechanism, where you can adjust your mobility to have greater stability on steeper slopes. And of course, the things I talked about with the athletes would also be a potential for exploring extreme terrains. So what are the main challenges in exploring extreme terrains? As you can see, there's ter terrain topologies, the extreme slopes. You could have significant sinkage if you get to the bottom of a crater. You also have the obstacles, the larger boulders. You also have communication challenges. Um, if you're trying to get into a crater side, you're trying to get into one of those caves, you won't have uh, line of sight communication with orbital assets, and it becomes a challenge. You also have, you may not be in the direct sunlight, so you do have power challenges again. If you go to places like a lunar cold trap, you're talking about temperatures of 40 to 70 Kelvin, extremely cold, and also pose significant thermal engineering challenges. So we, we like the challenges, so we took all these and tried to figure out, well, how can we build a rover that is simple, low mass, compact, versatile, robust, that can actually explore such terrains? Um, so working with a couple of students from mechanical engineering at Caltech, uh, students of Joel Burdick, in the summer of 2006, we took one of the older rovers and adapted it to become an extreme terrain. And that's why we developed the Axel rover. So if you look at this rover prototype, it's an extremely simple rover that provides some of these features that we talked about earlier. The best way to think about this rover is think of a yo-yo. Uh, and the way the yo-yo travels up and down doesn't even need any surface. This operates in a very similar fashion. A tether is wrapped around the center, center of the body. 
it has two wheels that are independently actuated, and there's two actuators, two motors that control the center of the body. One controls that arm relative to the body, and the other one controls a spool hidden behind this blue cover. And you can equip this with cameras, and if you build two hubs on inside the wheels that are, that are independent of the wheels, then that's where you can house your instruments. So that was a concept that we, um, we thought, well, if you have this thing and you have a tether, how do you actually get to the extreme area? It's going to be fairly difficult. You're going to have a very long tether. Now, one thing you can do is you can take two of these, combine them, have them docked to some kind of a central module, and now you do have a four-wheeled rover that has two identical front and back rovers that could be separated um, to explore extreme terrains. So here is an example of two possibilities. You can throw this on the lander, and that would require some pinpoint landing fairly close to the edge of a crater. But you're very limited in the mobility you can do, which is primarily around the lander as long as the tether can take you. And that we call the fixed mother mobile daughter architecture. Another option is this dual-axle option that we mentioned earlier, where you do have these two rovers docked, and this can travel without the tether, very similar to the rovers I showed earlier, Mer and Sojourner. And then as soon as you get to the area, the interesting areas, then you separate one of these axles and you go down the extreme terrain, collect your instruments, uh, collect your samples, bring them back up to the mothership. That's the mobile mother and mobile daughter architecture. Just to give you a little bit of history, and this actually, this concept came about a long time ago, in 1999, um, where NASA was looking for modular, reconfigurable robots that can self-repair. So back then, we thought of this two-wheel platform that is called a transporter, and then we put all the science module inside the central piece, and then you just take two rovers that transport them dock, and then you can build the train of these. Of course, you can do a lot with very simple things, so a few Lego uh, blocks from my childhood, I put this together, demonstrate that you can actually do this. You can some, get some cardboard, some uh, spare wheels in the lab, and you can build it. Then you, can, you get serious, you can start, you get a little bit of funding, you can start doing some serious design of that prototype. Then you can see, you can put two of them, you do the dual axle, you can put three and four and so forth. It becomes a train that's actually carrying these instruments. And if one of them fails, so you have a mission with 10, transporters, 10 science modules, and you can do that. So we built the first prototype. We got a little bit of money. We built the first prototype in 2000. And then, for some reason, NASA decided that they want to fund us anymore. And we tried to look at demonstrating the docking. And then this thing sat for a little while. And we had some students come in the summer and demonstrate mobility. Initially, it had some difficulty in terms of mobility. So we put these golf cleats on it. Now, in 2006, as you can see here, we actually, with work with uh, two students at Caltech, uh, Pablo Abad Monterola and Jeffrey Udland, we were actually able to put a tether on the system, turn it into a transporter that carries science module to an extreme terrain robot that can actually do go down steep slopes. We got, you know, and then we adjusted the wheels, we put some, um, uh, some uh, be better lenses on it, uh, ran the tether through, uh, upgraded some of the avionics, and we were able to demonstrate traversing up and down a makeshift crater wall, very steep crater wall. And this is an inside look where you can see the avionics, the cameras, and, and then the power system of the rover. And then work of a, a couple of Caltech students in the summer were able to demonstrate a new wheel design that can take you over 90% wheel diameter obstacles. Then we've built this later version in 2011, and the full version of the dual axle that we took out to the field in Arizona. And that's kind of the quick, brief history of how this concept was born to do something, and then it was adapted to do something else, and it came back to its original concept of this modular system, but now with a tether, and it allows you to do extreme terrain exploration. After we did all this work, very recently we discovered, JPL put out, look into archives, and realized that back in the 70s, people had a very similar ideas of using two-wheel mobility, and this was a system designed back then. I was not able to find out who the designer is and some of the people involved or some of the other references, but we do have that picture. And the more recently, we know a couple of people at JPL, including Jack Jones and, um, and, and others have developed this um, three-wheeled robot, very similar to Axel, but has a third wheel to actually explore extreme terrains. So some of these ideas come full circle. So if you take a closer look at what we've done uh, with this Axel rover, 
it's a system that's a fairly compact. It's a Ford Rover that has four primary actuators, as I described earlier. Uh, one driving each of the wheels, and then two, one of them driving the arm, and the other one driving a spool. Uh, this design, actually, the, the mechanical design was done by Jared Matthews at JPL. And it has the avionics and the batteries, and all the instruments go inside the wheels, but not attached to the wheels. And then they can get deployed from the side. Um, also, through, we did a number of analysis. So one of the things that we wanted to do is, well, if you have a two-wheeled rover, this is not going to be able to go over any obstacles. And that was the initial criticism, the early criticism of this concept. And if you put uh, bike tires, and you can see here, you can barely go over uh, small obstacles, and very quickly uh, you won't have the, enough, the drawbar pull to be able to go over larger obstacles. So you can see about three-inch obstacles that you can do with these mountain tires. But if you design the wheels differently and you use paddles, it changes the nature of the forces that interact with the rock, and you'll be able to pull yourself over obstacles. And as I said, we were able, with these paddle wheels, we can go over obstacles that are wheel radius, and with the different design that Caltech demonstrated, they demonstrated 92% of wheel radius. Now, the challenge is with paddle wheels is they're not very efficient. So if you use the mountain bike tires, they're, fairly, they're much more efficient than the paddle wheels. And you're constantly moving your center of mass up and down. So you do take a lot more uh, energy out of the system. Now the challenge is to come up with a design that allows you to do both get the efficiency as well as the ability to traverse rock. And you don't have to do that. Um, and there are, we've discussed a number of passive ways to do it with just a fixed design as well as changing the shape of the wheel depending on the terrain. Some of this analysis work was done by Pablo Abad Monterola and a couple of undergraduate students at Caltech. And here you can see the efficiency and energy consumption versus speed. And you can see the difference between the two. OK. Another challenge when you look at extreme terrain mobility is you're trying to go down a crater such as Shackleton Crater. And this is actual data from Shackleton Crater. There was a, a you know, portion of the uh, crater that we looked at. And how do you actually plan your path such that you don't get your tether tangled in a way that you can't come back up. And when you start looking at the different terrains, there's certain local uh, changes in the terrain where you do have obstacles, uh, both positive and negative obstacles, craters within, within this, that you have to actually plan your path. Going down is not as challenging as coming back up. And the reason is you're paying out your tether as you go down. The challenge comes in is when you're trying to go back up. And that will, you know, that will have to, you know, in certain areas, the tether will have to be very taut to pull yourself up. And so you have to plan the way back up before you go down. So this is some of the work, the PhD uh, work of Pablo Abad Monterola, who is a student of Joel Burdick at Caltech. And he actually looked at developing the theory behind motion planning for a tethered platform for such environments. Here's an example of a negative obstacle where you're on the crater and there's a small crater within this, on the slope. Okay. Okay. So what we've done is, in addition to building a number of prototypes, we wanted to actually take it out to the field because you learn a, a lot of things when you actually take these rovers out to the field. So we did two field tests. One of them was in Canyon Country in California, which is about 20 minutes from here. And also, um, or maybe 40 minutes. And the other one was in Arizona. Um, we went with the MSL team where they did their test site, which is in this area. And that's where we conducted the field test. So let me play this movie here. It's a little bit of entertainment. So these are the, this is Newton Crater on Mars where these flows were observed. A very interesting place to go and analyze. This is Cape St. Vincent from Victoria Crater. And then these are pictures of the lunar um, coal traps and uh, caves, collapsed lava tubes. So when we, did, when we did the Mars testing, we went to a Mars analog site. This is in um, Black Lava Point in Arizona near Flagstaff. And one of the things we wanted to do is have this rover, you know, get to the top of where there is the cliff face so it can go down and then do analysis on the layer stratigraphy. So what you're observing here is 
uh, rover going up about the 35 to 40 degree slope. And if you notice that the uh, back axle has a roll joint between it and the central body, while the front doesn't. And that gives it the ability to negotiate and overcome these obstacles. Now here, it's, if you notice carefully, it's trying to turn. So this is, doesn't, at the moment, it doesn't have any steering, so it's doing a skid steering. And it can take very sharp turns. Now what you see here is a separation of the two-wheeled axle from the, the rest of the system. It deploys a leg, so it doesn't, have, you know, doesn't drop the central body on the ground. And then the axle goes over the terrain. And it's here, this is an area where it's about 50, 60 degrees. Now, as it's hanging on the tether, without moving the rover, it orients the instrument, deploys it. If you think about this thing, this is actually a turret on wheels. We combine the functionality of the arm and the mobility into one. And with four actuators, you're able to traverse steep terrains as well as uh, acquire measurements. See, at the same spot, we took a measurement with a microscopic imager, spectrometer, and a thermal probe. And then we can go down and keep doing that at different levels. And we can control it very well because we do have the tether. You're not going to go anywhere by hanging from the tether. So you really control precisely the measurements you take at every layer. And this is an important feature for the scientists to be able to acquire these measurements at the point of their choosing. Now, this is a little bit more challenging terrain. So it just came down and 80 this is about 80 degrees in slope. And again, it's using its yo-yo capabilities. And it's coming down, and then it's transitioning to a terrain about 50, 50 to 60 degrees. Now, these two black spots in the front, these are the stereoscopic cameras that Dimitri and uh, his team are working on trying to acquire the calibration data. This is the um, microscopic uh, measurement that was just taken. And then you can do things such as uh, trenching. So you just spin one wheel, keep everything else fixed. You can remove the uh, top layer and acquire another spectroscopy measurement. So every time you see the wheel spinning, that's what it's doing. Um, and then you can see the slope. That's about 50 degrees. It looks steeper, but it's actually only 50 to 60 degrees. And then here it gets to 80. Now, this is not easy, and there's challenges. You can see here, as the rover's trying to climb over this uh, edge, which is about a 90 degree edge, it's having a hard time. Nonetheless, nobody interfered, and we, tr we challenged the team to try to overcome this thing, and of course, they did. Um, and then one, one thing um, we wanted to make sure is, well, what if we throw it in a field full of rocks? If you just noticed here, the rover just high-centered, and then we throw it in a field where there's a lot of boulders. This is about 30 degree slope, and you can see the tether snagged around this point here. And we wanted to see, can the rover drive all the way down and get back up without anybody interfering unsnag the tether where it's or whatever snagged. So this is a view from this GoPro camera on the rover as it's climbing up. It's very hard to get the sense of the slope, but you, if you look at the horizon, you see how, you know, it's very, very steep angle. So, um, so it's right, trying to climb up, and then it's going to come up to two large boulders, which are the two boulders right here. Uh, it goes fairly quickly, as you just watch. So it's not going to be able to go over them right away. It adjusts its position, can't get up, adjusts its orientation, and then goes over the rocks. Now, this rock is larger than a wheel diameter, but of course, the tether is pulling you up, so you have enough force to pull you up. We also took it to a, uh, to a canyon country. This is a mining uh, site here. It's a local quarry. And you, you, this is about 65 to 80 degree slope. And some of it is fairly loose debris. And some of this debris was falling on the road. You can see here it's going to even it's gonna drop. Um, and the, the idea is this link does not contact the ground as it's going down, and neither does it do that as it's going up. So you can see the rover can go up and down fairly reliably with, um, with this type of uh, platform. Now also, as we're going up and down, the same way we orient the instruments, we orient the cameras. So we can orient the cameras in any way we want, and then it just finds its way back up to the top. These two guys here, uh, this is uh, Jeffrey Udland and Robert Peters are just making sure nothing goes wrong. This was our first test on a slope. This was prior to the Arizona. Um, okay. Okay. So let me uh, s summarize some concluding thoughts. Um, so where would we like to take this? So some of the earlier work I talked about related to the autonomy, the perception, the visual target tracking. You can envision, you can get all these capabilities on a rover like I just showed you with the axle and dual axle rovers. This will give us the ability to explore extreme terrains and be able to conduct the same investigation we've done on relatively flat terrain into extreme terrains. 
it's very important to continue to advance mobility and autonomy because it's going to extend our reach in exploring planetary bodies. We've seen a lot of the recent discoveries, the caves, the flows, the activities, we're all not in benign terrain, but in extreme terrains. The crater floors are of interest, but if we cannot have a way to reliably get the rover that sinks into these out of there, then we will never go there. So what's important is to try to go after the size of, of large scientific interest and to try to look for ways of advancing state of the art. Extreme environments, whether it's topography, whether it's temperature, or, or otherwise, it's going to be a challenge for the future. And we will still remain with the same communication constraints and we still have the same harsh space environment that we'll have to design around. Space missions are very expensive, as you all know, and the opportunities to go there are very, very few. And it's very important to find ways, new ideas, new approaches that will help us advance the state of the art and overcome these challenges. And then I think autonomy will play a key role in our future systems, robotic exploration of space. And this is all to complement the human exploration of space. Today is Yuri's night, and um, it's very important to look at robotics and human as complementary activities. Uh, prototyping and field testing of any system are critical to really understanding their behavior, pushing the limits, push the limits with the prototypes, uh, push the limits uh, with the field testing so we can see where they actually fail. And with that, I want to uh, go over and acknowledge there's a number of people who were involved in a lot of the work I described. There's a number of teams. I want to thank the Axel team, which Dimitri is a member, and Dorian who, from Finland, who's actually a student with us has been a member of this team, as well as uh, the rest of the team at JPL. I also want to thank our Caltech Axel team, uh, Pablo Abadman, jo Professor Burdick, and, and then his students, uh, former student Pablo Abadmontrola, who got his PhD from Caltech, Jeffrey Udland, who's soon to get his PhD, Melissa Tanner, who's currently working with us, and a number of undergraduate students. I also want to thank the uh, SKIP team that did the actual precise go-to and touch, uh, Michael and, and, and Mike Fleedier, the visual tracking team. And also there's a large Clarity team that developed the software. A lot of the, so the uh, capabilities I showed you was developed by the Clarity team, as well as the MER team I should have included here, uh, Mark Maimoun, uh, who has developed the navigation uh, for the rovers. And also I would like to acknowledge our sponsors and I particularly thank Caltech and the Keck Institute for Space Studies for their support. Uh, a couple of years ago in 2009, in the same building, we, we had the extreme terrain workshop that we hosted at, with the support of the Keck Institute, and we'd like to thank them for that, as well as thanking uh, the several JPL offices who have funded us through the years. And I want to thank you all for attending the talk, and I'm happy to take on any questions. No, everything you've seen was all teleoperated. So the operator was actually looking at the rover and observing it and just joysticking it around effectively. Um, what we're currently working on is actually trying to bring the autonomy I showed in the first portion of my talk onto the axle. Now, of course, there will be some changes uh, because we're no longer on the flat terrain with the boulders. We're on extreme terrains and the dynamics as well as the, um, the way we perceive the environment and build the maps. It's going to be slightly different, but there's a, there's a significant amount where we, that will transition over, and that's what we're currently working on. There's also the, there was a docking and undocking process, and right now, one of the things that Dorian is working on is actually automating the process and using perception to do autonomous docking and undocking. Mm -hmm. Any other, any other questions? Well, things change, and so sometimes we, they grow larger and then they grow back smaller. Uh, it's very much driven, you know, if you look at the way these are costed, uh, funding availability drives, you know, what you can do. And if you have a very limited budget, then it drives the, the size down. But the size is really primarily driven by the suite of science instruments you host on the rover. And you start off 
What is the investigation you want to do? What's the justification for it? Then what kind of instruments you need? And that drives everything else. But there are other key factors that come into play uh, as well. But I think the primary drivers, they start with the science requirements, which drives everything else. Um, in, in the, there was, there are also, having said that, there are some engineering constraints. For example, if you invest X millions of dollars in building an EDL system to land a certain mass, um, changing that is very costly and very difficult because you have to go through a revalidation of everything you've done, so that may not be feasible. So, so initially, when uh, we were going forward with the 2018, we was going to use the same uh, MSL lander, EDL system, which was heavily invested in. Yes? Uh, a number of the algorithms I described are being used on MSL. So Mark Maimoun is putting the navigation, the autonomous navigation, similar to MER. Juan uh, Kim, who's doing the visual tracking, is also has uh, in integrated that on MSL. Um, so, and the visual odometry is also on MSL. So a number of these algorithms will, will be on MSL. It will be in motion when there's no... Uh, yes, 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 similar to MER. They will drive. What they will do, they do receive their instructions once a day. They get a sequence of things to do. Part of it says drive 90 meters uh, blind, and then after that, turn on the autonomous navigation and go another 70 meters you, without us seeing what the terrain looks like. Uh, we do have the orbital imagery, but we don't have the local view. because of the speed. So when, you're doing, when you do blind, you can go 100 meters, 120 meters an hour, you do it autonomously, it's only 30 meters an hour. Actually, I did have a slide right there, because I want to make sure I got the numbers right. So blind is 120 meters an hour, and auto, auto nav is 10 to 35. And with, if you use visual geometry, it's 10 to 35, uh, 10, 10 meters an hour. It's processing power. The MSL is more capable than MER, and uh, it will be faster, but still will, it, will, it will require a good amount of processing. There is ongoing work as a team in my group, Mc, uh, Mike McHenry and uh, Tom Howard, who are actually taking some of these algorithms and putting them on FPGA processors that, are, that have a path for flight qualification, and these actually will be moving forward um, in some form in the future, hopefully. For a, for a mission to enable faster driving. Yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought yes that question. So if you look at it, when you're trying to get into slopes, uh, one of the things that could happen, and this actually happened in, let me go back here. Let me just stop this thing and go. Um, to the slide here. Okay. So if you look at the, this was a Dante rover, and Dante went into the crater, and then on its way up, as the, you know, as this was going up, there was, it, it moved to the side, and there was lateral pull on the tether, and that caused it to tip over. So a tip over could be mission ending, and that's why we wanted to have a symmetric one. If you have this two-wheeled rover that move to the side and there's enough lateral pull on the tether, it, can it will flip it, and that's okay. All what you have to do is turn your motors the other way. And that's why symmetry was important in this design. So, in particular, because we are going on extreme terrains, 60, 70 degree slopes, where things like that, you can go over a rock and tip over if you're too far to the side. So, you can start rotating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And actually, we did that. In, in one of the tests, when we did, there was one of the pictures where we did the makeshift crater. We had, on purpose, an overhang. And then, of course, the rover will spin. And then you have to figure out, as you go up, to orient it properly. Yes. So that's a very good question. So we looked at, when we were looking at exploring Shackleton crater, we started looking at kilometers of tether. Um, one of the things I did mention, the tether has two functions, well, three functions. 
it carries as a strength member. It has provides power and communication. So it has, and it has it's redundant. Uh, when you look at kilometers, you can put kilometers of tether, and you can make them fairly thin. Um, this one we had is about four millimeter in diameter. Um, you can go longer distances. But what we also realized with the dual axle architecture is that we can go over 30 and 40 degree slopes. So in the case of Shackleton, we can go down the crater, and then when you see a coal trap, you just send it over. So you may only need a couple of hundred meters of tether in most cases. But you can design up to, we looked at, up to two kilometers. Um, some of the challenges become loss, power loss, through the, uh, uh, through the conductors. Also thermal impact, heat rejection when it's all wrapped up. Um, but with a couple of kilometers for the lunar case that we looked at, we looked at both thermal, it, it was feasible. The loss would not be significant. If you start getting larger, because there was talk about doing tens of kilometers, then it becomes problematic. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, attending the talk. Thank you.